Hello again, Shalom. This is Les Lawrence and our Issachar Forum update. This is our fourth one on the 30 minute updates we're doing now every week, trying to get them posted by 6 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We have a lot to uh, talk about uh, today, so uh, I want to get right to it. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and honor you that you are Jehovah God. You are the God of all creation. And it is your Son, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, who is the one who is our Savior, and he is God the Son. We honor him as such. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide our thoughts and our time together. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, I'd like to start out first uh, with just a quick reference back to my uh, Elisha Vision commentary, which is on the internet. Uh, you can go there anytime at uh, www.elishavision.wordpress.com and that's Elisha, not Elijah. And uh, the uh, post I put a few days ago was uh, called Don't Feed the Animals. And there's several points in it, but I want to pick out just a couple of things. Of course, the, there's, a, there's been a little saying that's been going around the inter internet quite a bit uh, this past week or so about the fact that uh, the Department of Agriculture has uh, been, there are more people on food stamps than any time in history and uh, at the same time the same Department of Agriculture says please don't feed the animals in the state parks or the national parks I mean because the animals may grow dependent and not learn to take care of themselves I guess we can do that with people give them handouts and uh, and that won't affect them but animals will not be able to take care of themselves if you give them handouts I think it works both for both groups and uh, in the context of this particular blog, I, I uh, made the point about you can never satisfy a demanding spirit. And, uh, and that's what appeasement is. In the Middle East, in fact throughout history, anytime uh, there's an attempt to appease uh, someone, a demanding leader, uh, Hitler's the classic example, when uh, he was making his demands and Neville Chamberlain in 1939 went to Berlin and met with Hitler and, and he uh, came back to England waving a pe piece of paper in the air saying peace in our time and uh, said Mr. Hitler doesn't want to take over all of Europe he just wants a little bit of Czechoslovakia and so they gave it to him and of course that didn't satisfy his demand and uh, so I, I wrote this little sentence that I think is kind of profound uh, maybe I have to explain it <laughs> so but uh, it's appeasement is a dead end appeasement is a dead end uh, make a good bumper sticker because anytime you try to uh, appease a demanding spirit it actually leads to death uh, it doesn't ever satisfy and uh, now the newest blog I put up uh, is uh, is one that uh, I think if you haven't gone to it yet please go to uh, the blog site elishavision.wordpress.com uh, it's called Assad's Boast and uh, in it there's a picture of a billboard in Damascus, the picture is actually from 2006 of uh, Bashar Assad, the dictator of Damascus and of Syria, and the poster actually says that uh, the God of Islam actually names the God of Islam, which I don't say out loud, but it says the God of Islam will protect Syria, and uh, that is just uh, an interesting challenge. And I just think the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, Jehovah God, uh, has something else to say about that. Because in, in, uh, in Isaiah 17, verse 1, he says Damascus is going to be destroyed and will cease from being a city. So we have this billboard, and there's a picture of it on my blog uh, that says the God of Islam will protect Syria. And uh, God, our God says that, that uh, Damascus is going to be destroyed. So we'll see who wins that one. I don't have any doubt about it. And now some good news. Uh, it's been raining all week in, uh, in Israel. In fact, uh, it's been snowing. They had snow in Jerusalem. Uh, at least three or four inches, I think, came uh, in Jerusalem on uh, Friday. And uh, they actually had uh, the Sea of Galilee actually rose more than a foot just this last, in four days. Uh, it's still several feet below where it needs to be, about 12 or 15 feet below where it needs to be. But it's gaining. In fact, I think it was 18 feet. Now it's down to about, I think, around 12 or 13. So uh, pray that the rains will continue and the snow will continue. The snow was not only a couple feet up in Mount Hermon, but 
It snowed even in the mountains of the Negev, the desert of the south of Israel. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty uh, big blessing for Israel, and I praise the Lord for that. Now, as we look at some of the news that's going on this weekend, uh, in, in uh, this coming week, there's some amazing uh, things happening, <laughs> coming kind of, uh, kind of um, happening at the same time here, merging uh, a little bit. Uh, one is uh, there's been an election in Iran. The results are in, and in, uh, in the uh, it's a big shocker, a big surprise. Uh, the Ayatollah's party uh, won big, <laughs> uh, and uh, actually there is some news in it, and that is that Ahmadinejad, the president, is actually losing some of uh, his party's seats, and there's been a little bit of a standoff between Ayatollah Khamenei and uh, and uh, Ahmadinejad. So. Uh, that's an interesting development, although uh, the Prime Minister, the President, Ahmadinejad, only has uh, another year or so of his term, and he can't run for a third term, so uh, he's probably going to be uh, uh, kind of passing off the scene anyway before long. But the real power has always been the Ayatollah, and uh, he's sort of solidifying his hold on the Iranian uh, government. Uh, so that election has already been taken, has already taken place. Uh, today, uh, Sunday in uh, Russia, is the big election, presidential election, and um, that'll probably be a victory by about, probably uh, Putin will probably get about 85% of the vote. Uh, that's the way it works in uh, those, those kinds of countries. They don't really have real democracies. It's just kind of a sham, a show thing to prop up a leader. And so that's pretty big news that uh, Vladimir Putin is going to be the, uh, the prime minister of, of in, ahead of, uh, of Russia again, and uh, he's pretty much, uh, there's a fact, there's an interesting blog on uh, Joel Rosenberg's blog uh, entitled New Czar Rising, Russia's election on March 4th may prove a bigger deal than our own election, and I recommend that blog if you want to look at uh, Joel's, Joel Rosenberg, Joel's, Joel Rosenberg's blog. Now, um, the uh, Moving to our own uh, attitude about uh, what's developing there with Iran and Israel, and our our attitude towards that as the United States and the uh, Obama administration, this is a critical weekend for U.S.-Israel relationships because um, even as we speak, uh, there are meetings going on in Washington D.C. Uh, the uh, American-Israel affairs uh, political political action. Committee. It's an eight. It's called APAC, and it's the biggest pro-Israel gathering of the year. It follows by a, just a couple of weeks the uh, CPAC, the Conservative Polit Political Action uh, Committee. So, uh, in some major speeches there, Shimon Peres, the President of Israel, uh, spoke there. I believe it was on Saturday. Uh, President Obama and Pre and Prime Minister Netanyahu, who's in Washington now, are both speaking there today. And uh, as I record this, I haven't uh, had a chance to, to um, monitor their speeches, but I uh, encourage you to do so if you get a chance or, or watch the replays of them. And then Monday, uh, President Obama and Netanyahu are going to meet together uh, in Washington, and, and this is really a, a pretty big showdown uh, because uh, Obama uh, continues to stonewall in terms of the U.S.'s position about Iran and whether or not we would support Israel fully and so forth, and and uh, pressuring Israel not to uh, try to take out the nuclear facilities, and and it's just it's no secret Obama's just been openly campaigning almost for uh, for that, and, and, and at the same time, Prime Minister Netanyahu is is adamantly committed to defending Israel and not allowing. Iran to get a nuclear weapon. So there's been this kind of back and forth and discussions, uh, and and there's <laughs> mark my word, there are going to be there's going to be news that comes out of the, this meeting on Monday. Uh, I hope it's good news. I hope Obama uh, agrees uh, some to some more hardline positions about Iran. Although I don't predict that. I don't. I don't expect that. I hope he does. Um, he uh, recently, in fact, just this week, in uh, I think it was an interview in the Atlantic uh, magazine on Friday, uh, he actually cautions Israel against a premature attack on Iran, and he rejects red lines, 
Now that's something you could easily miss in reading the, the news. Well, first of all, you know, this talk about red lines is Israel has some pretty red lines. They're, they will not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons because for them it's existential. It means the actual survival of the country. If Iran and the Ayatollahs get the bomb, they'll use it. They, they've been threatening to and, and declaring that they'll do that for months, or actually for years. And uh, so Netanyahu wants some red lines where, where if Iran reaches a certain point, the U.S. will uh, join Israel in attacking. Well, Obama refuses that. In fact, it was just Friday that he made that, uh, that public uh, interview in the Atlantic Magazine. Now, the interesting thing is what happened Friday. Friday, a line, in fact, if you looked at it on the map, it was a red line of tornadoes passed across the center of our country, killing at least 38 people. Uh, they expect that death toll to rise. In fact, in this week alone, there have been over 50 people killed by these tornadoes. Uh, I find that very interesting that Obama refuses a red line to protect Israel, and then a red line of tornadoes uh, devastates the center of our country and kills many people. Uh, now, I'm not alone in that uh, analogy. I've, for years I followed um, William Koenig, who is a White House correspondent. He wrote a book called Eye to Eye, where he documents, and he's been doing this for years, every time the United States makes a, uh, a negative or pressure against Israel or pronounces a declaration against God's purpose for Israel, something happens in the United States, whether it's a storm or an economic collapse or um, various things, but this isn't something you can make up. You can look in history and see that it's happened. In fact, uh, on, uh, on Bill Koenig's website, uh, right at this very time, his international news site, uh, he has a picture of the tornadoes and uh, the red lines. There were 98 tornadoes already in March. Uh, and uh, excuse me, that was just Friday, and it's the most in one day in March in U.S. history. And uh, he uh, shows a picture of the uh, of the devastation. Uh, but then he makes a little interesting thing uh, comment. He says, uh, "Let's uh, let's just kind of look back a little bit in in history." And he points out that last year, when President Obama spoke to APAC, the same Israel conference that he's speaking to today. Last year when he spoke there uh, was the time when the tornadoes, 40 tornadoes, hit the United States. And uh, you'll, you'll recall that one that hit Joplin, Missouri. Uh, that was an EF5 tornado and, and hundreds of people in that tornado season in Alabama and Missouri and all around were killed. I think it was over 200 people. And uh, again, is it just coincidence that it's when President Obama is doing his sort of double talk with, with the Israel uh, conference in in uh, Washington. I I just ask you that, and you can answer it yourself. <laughs> now um, there is one indication that the U.S. may be doing something that's good for Israel. Uh, there's an article in Debka file um, on March 1st that says that the Pentagon is preparing aerial refueling for Israeli planes striking Iran in a dramatic U-turn to show Israel that Washington is serious about its military option. Against Iran's nuclear program, Pentagon officials disclosed Thursday that military options being prepared start with providing refueling for Israeli planes and include attacking the pillars of the clerical regime, including the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and its elite Quds Force, the regular Iranian military bases, and the Mil Ministry of Intelligence and Security. Uh, the official spoke on condition of anonymity in Washington's first public reference to possible joint military action with Israel against Iran. Uh, I have two comments about that report. I hope that it's simply a, a, an honest and clear indication that the U.S. will help Israel. Uh, I'm not sure that it is, though. I'm a little concerned about it. The fact that it's anonymous, the fact that the president seems to be saying just the opposite, uh, hold back, don't attack, uh, it would be premature. Those, that's what the president is saying. And uh, so with that context, and since this is kind of the only indication of, of something helpful, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned about it. I think maybe that 
uh, it's uh, in fact you may recall I think I commented on this in the last few weeks that that when uh, Leon Panetta the head of the Pentagon the Secretary of Defense spoke uh, a couple weeks ago he actually uh, said publicly that he felt like Israel was going to attack Iran April May or June and at the time I sort of half jokingly and half seriously said well why doesn't he give them the targets too we might as well announce the targets where they'll be hitting well in this article they do <laughs> the, the Pentagon official anonymously actually names the Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Quds Force, the military bases, the Ministry of Intelligence and Security actually lists the targets so uh, the only thing left is to is to give the coordinates uh, so that uh, or maybe you know so anyway I'm I'm not uh, I'm not buying this, as you can tell, probably. <laughs> uh, and we need to pray. We need to pray. That's what we need to do. Now, um, there's an interesting uh, article in uh, in the uh, Israel Today magazine, another one of my favorite sources, the Middle East. Um, it just makes it makes the point, and you can look at the article yourself. But uh, it, it suggests: Is this the last Netanyahu Obama meeting before the Iran strike? And it makes a pretty good uh, case that it probably would be. Uh, you you wouldn't expect uh, Israel to attack while Netanyahu's in Washington, but uh, once his uh, wheels hit the ground back in uh, Israel, uh, I'd say uh, from then on it's very very possible. And so we'll we're, we'll watch this meeting Monday with great interest as to what uh, what results are. Um, I understand there's not going to be a joint. Uh, press conference, but there may be a joint statement, which is uh, an interesting kind of a minimizing of it by the by uh, by President Obama. <clears throat> All right, now let's uh, get a little bit more to the actual news going on over in the Middle East itself. Uh, one of the things we've been watching is Turkey, and, uh, and I'm still talking about the Iran uh, crisis with their nukes, and also Iran's part in Syria, because uh, Russia, Iran, and China have actually been supporting the, the uh, dictator of Syria, Assad, and uh, Turkey has spoken out, the president of Turkey, on uh, last Thursday, this past Thursday, uh, said that uh, Russia and Iran would soon realize they have little choice but to join international diplomatic efforts for the removal of Syrian President Bashar Assad. And you say, well, what's, so what? Well, this is an indication, actually evidence, that Turkey is beginning to feel their oats. Or Turkey is beginning to sort of set the tone. And they're actually speaking to Russia and Iran, and indirectly, indirectly to China, to uh, uh, stop supporting uh, the dictator of Syria and uh, recognize they, they better get with the program with the rest of the world. And that fits into the scenario that we've been talking about that that Turkey will will uh, be the real leader in the years to come, and the the new caliphate will be established there, where it fell in 1924. The new caliph will probably be ruling from Turkey. So, uh, interesting evidence uh, in that direction. Um, one of the things that uh, it, it kind of a typical uh, political uh, actions of the president uh, Obama. Uh, he's still trying to draw Iran into nuclear talks. And the history of that is 100% that every time we talk with Iran, we, we stop our, we back off of our, our, uh, our pressure and we start talking. They then are free for several months or years, however long we're willing to keep the talks going, to go ahead and develop on, and work on their, their nuclear uh, program. And so President Obama still doesn't get it. He's still trying to do that. And, uh, and he's actually, according to uh, Deb Kefile, um in an article uh, February 26th, uh, it, the theory is put forward that uh, President Obama is trying to draw Iran into nuclear talks and that he gave kind of some bait by, by refusing to oust Assad of Syria. And uh, so trying to play kind of a diplomatic game uh, we'll let you keep Syria if you'll come and talk. And uh, that is so futile, and really, it's appeasement. And appeasement is a dead end. All right? Um, still with Syria, there are tanks uh, deployed uh, Sunday now in 
the main city in eastern Syria. Uh, most of the talk, most of the action has been in uh, central Syria with Homs and Homa and even within Damascus there have been some deaths. Uh, but now another city in eastern uh, Syria, army tanks are deployed in uh, uh, the Air al-Zor, another possible flashpoint. Opposition sources uh, say the Free Syrian Army, the rebels uh, in the city, have been arming and organizing over the last two months as Assad forces focused on homes. Uh, so it looks like there's about to be another uh, breakout over there. And so just stay tuned. I'm convinced that there's over 10,000 Syrian, uh, uh, their own people have been killed by their government uh, in, a, in a year's time. And it's a, a shame that the world's not doing anything about it. <clears throat> um, speaking of a shame, really a shame, there is a story, uh, several different sources. Uh, it's on World Net Daily, Joseph Farrar's, uh, Farrar's site, um, who's a, who's a uh, believer. And uh, it's a story about uh, one of the, or actually the person who planned the suicide bombing attack in Jerusalem uh, a number of years ago in the Sabaro Pizza place. Uh, and 15 civilians were wounded and seven of them were children, even babies. Uh, I mean, excuse me, killed. 15 were killed. Uh, 130 were wounded. Seven children and babies were killed, se several babies. Now, this woman who planned that attack is now a talk show host on Hamas TV, on Al Quds TV, uh, which is affiliated with Hamas. Uh, the, the, the shamelessness of it is just breathtaking. Um, another thing that happened in, in the past week or so is a, uh, the, the idea that the Israel Defense Forces uh, actually went in and, and shut down a, a couple TV stations in Ramallah in the West Bank uh, Palestinian TV stations because um, they found out that these two stations were using their radio transmissions and their television transmissions to actually uh, interfere with the communications at Ben Gurion Airport. And uh, that could have had serious consequences. So Israel stopped that immediately. Um, a little bit from Egypt, uh, you re recall we talked a few, uh, a week or two ago about the uh, Americans that were taking uh, refuge in the, is in the American embassy because they were being charged with crimes and uh, including uh, uh, the son of a high official in the U.S., Ro uh, Ray LaHood's son. Uh, and they were working with non-governmental organizations that are really nothing to it, but they were going to be uh, charged with crimes. Well, uh, Seven American rights workers are on a plane out of Egypt after the U.S. paid the U.S. paid nearly five million dollars in bail to secure their freedom. A freedom. Egyptian officials said the U.S. paid three hundred dollars each for sixteen Americans, and nine of whom were already out of the country. So they just bribed them basically, and they let them go. And uh, that's a, that was actually a report on Fox News on March first. Uh, but then. Uh, Today or yesterday, there was a report on uh, the Jerusalem Post. Uh, this is the reaction of the Egyptian, the new Egyptian parliament, which is 75% Muslim radicals, Muslim Brotherhood and Salafis. And uh, the parliament speaker decries interference behind the decision to release these, these Americans. And there's a kind of an uproar uh, developing. And uh, I would say we probably haven't heard the, the last of that. Um, now, as we, as we uh, survey the Middle Eastern scene, and even our own uh, scene here in the United States, of course, the elections continue. Tuesday is the, uh, what's called Super Tuesday. Ten states are going to be uh, voting in the primary for the Republican candidate. We're living in very serious times, and uh, many things are being decided. Uh, one of the things that we've, we've used, a word we've used to describe where we are, is we're in a time of acceleration. Uh, we're in a time of acceleration of history. Uh, things that used to occur over a period of uh, years now are happening in months. Uh, things that used to take months are happening in a week. And things that used to take a week to, to uh, uh, develop are happening in a day and, and just overnight. And so that seems to be where we are right now. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu warned that the, a nuclear Iran would choke the world economy. And uh, he's, gonna, he's here in Washington to urge 
President Obama to publicly back an attack on Iran. We'll see what happens. Um, there's a few scriptures I want to close with. Uh, the fruit of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. That's Isaiah 32, 17. Uh, in regards to the, uh, the terrible uh, deaths that are being occurring in Syria, uh, Isaiah 33, 7 says, Their brave men cry aloud in the streets. The envoys of peace weep bitterly. Uh, even even uh, uh, the UN head, Bon, uh, bon from Korea, the head of the United Nations uh, has actually been appealing to Syria and getting no, no satisfaction. Uh, but for Israel, uh, Psalm 146, verse 5, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in Jehovah, his God. Hallelujah. And uh, Psalm 16, 3, As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. That's what our God says about his people. And that applies not only to uh, Israel and the, the Israelis who love God, but, but the Christian believers around the world who love the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And one other thing to look forward to a little bit in the future is uh, at the end of this month, uh, March 30th, they're calling for another million people to march on Israel, to come literally just walk across the borders. Uh, they tried to do that a year ago on Nakba Day, Catastrophe Day it's called, and uh, it was pretty much a flop. Uh, but they're going to be trying it again, so we need to be begin now praying all month uh, against that endeavor uh, on, on the part of uh, the international groups as they band together to do that. So uh, that's the update um, for this week and uh, I, I uh, do ask you to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and uh, we'll be talking to you again Lord willing next week. God bless. Bye-bye.